Thank you for joining us today. My name is Katie Leeper and I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Ocean Discovery League. And today I will be co-hosting this session with Nadia Rosley, the Capacity Development Program Manager at Ocean Discovery League. Before we get started, I wanted to bring to your attention that we will be using Slido during this presentation to hear from the community. You can either join now using the QR code on the screen or when the poll questions come up later on in the session. Nadia is also putting a URL of the Slido page into the chat if you'd like to access it with the device you're watching this presentation on. Along with that, Nadia is also putting a link to the Deuce folder, which holds version one of the work that we'll be presenting today. So let's take a quick look at the agenda for this call. We will start by providing some context to this work and explaining the current landscape of monitoring and evaluation in the sector. This will be followed by sharing our approach and the definition of deep sea capacity development that we have synthesized from our Deuce breakout sessions from previous years. We will then present our newly developed maturity model, which is the first of its kind for the deep sea sector. This will be followed by showing how this can be incorporated into pre-existing tools like the theory of change, and we will then close the webinar with a Q&A and hearing your initial impressions. Please note that while much of what will be presented today will have a deep sea sector focus, this work and approach is applicable to the entire ocean sciences sector. Ocean Discovery League was founded by deep sea explorer, Dr. Katie Croft Bell, who recognized that our limited understanding of the deep ocean stems from today's inefficient, expensive and inequitable approaches to deep sea exploration and research. To address this problem, Ocean Discovery League's mission is to accelerate deep ocean exploration by developing accessible systems to broaden the community of those who explore and understand the deep sea. At Ocean Discovery League, we focus on three areas to achieve this. The first is targeted exploration. This focuses on approaching global deep sea exploration in a more representative and equitable way than has ever been done before. The second is developing low cost easy to use data collection and analysis systems to increase efficiency and reduce barriers to the technologies required for exploration. And lastly, is broadening the community. This involves expanding and diversifying the community um, of deep sea explorers through education and training with historically excluded communities. And this is where the current work we're presenting fits into. So let's take a current look at the landscape of monitoring and evaluation in the sector. The current challenge that we face in the deep sea sector is that deep sea exploration is limited to high income regions and low income and middle income regions lack access to deep sea tools and expertise. This in turn creates a global inequity that hinders research agendas, limit scientific exploration and excludes individuals from appreciating the value of the deep ocean. In 2022, Ocean Discovery League conducted the Global Deep Sea Capacity Assessment. Uh, this was a baseline assessment of the technical and human capacity for deep sea exploration and research in every coastal area with deep ocean worldwide. Of the 10 findings, there were three key findings that are pertinent to the, this work. One, in many places there is expertise without technology. Two, there is a need for more deep sea vehicle access to activate available expertise. And three, training is a critical opportunity. So I will um, discuss a bit about what's currently happening in the deep sea community space when it comes to capacity development and give you a background to the work that we are doing um, through this monitoring and evaluation initiative. So we recognize that organizations in the deep sea research and ocean sciences are already doing work to enhance capacity in this sector 
And this is also true for Ocean Discovery League, where we will be carrying out um, a lot more capacity development programs this year and uh, beyond. And to have these programs to um, have meaningful impact, but there's currently a lack of standardized benchmarks or matrix to guide the work and assess the impact of capacity development initiatives in the DC research and exploration space compared to other sectors. So how can we ensure that the programs we are running um, will be accountable uh, to the stakeholders and also to other people who will be impacted by this work? So this challenge of ensuring capacity development initiatives in the DC sector are recordable, measurable, and comparable year on year uh, was discussed in a paper produced in 2022 by Harden Davis um, about the capacity development in Ocean Decade and beyond, where they highlighted that currently capacity development in ocean science has yet to have effective, transferable, and repeatable monitoring standards. Um, they also raised the need for the creation of explicit spaces where stakeholders, scientists, policymakers, and those involved in capacity development programs can speak openly about their experiences. So revisiting this paper uh, was really the inspiration or the impetus to the work um, for this monitoring and evaluation initiative, where um, I initially wanted to think about how we can even start addressing this gap in the DC community and how do we go about this? So there is a Malay saying, um, it goes, alang-alang menyeluk pekasam biar sampai ke pangkal lengan. It means if you're going to reach into the pickle jar, might as well you put your whole arm in it. So our entry point into this monitoring and evaluation jar was firstly to do desktop research to compare monitoring and evaluation frameworks and standards um, for deep sea and ocean science, specifically looking for something that would be relevant across organizations with the global south and marginalized communities in mind. Uh, we recognize the importance of effective monitoring and evaluation practices in the specialized field of deep sea research and exploration, which involves collaboration among various organizations and stakeholders. Um, there is also a growing recognition of the need to assess and enhance the capacity of individuals, teams, and organizations involved in these complex initiatives, and also to um, be familiar and also to uh, recognize as well that uh, monitoring and evaluation in general uh, would support better planning and decision-making, support learning and exchange, uh, provide accountability to funders and citizens, and gather information for reporting. Uh, in terms of key principles that we wanted to look for in terms of monitoring and evaluation standards would be that it should be um, context specific to the capacity development programs that we are running. And it needs to commit to collaboration with diverse groups. Um, and what we need now actually would be the involvement of stakeholders and their reflection on relationships and responsibilities and having that two-way accountability. And it is also important to prioritize the lift virtues of organizations and individuals over the monitoring and evaluation system itself, whereby any monitoring and evaluation frameworks or tools that we look at uh, should be simple, feasible, and focus on stakeholders' ownership of capacity building. Uh, next, we also looked at various monitoring and evaluation tools or frameworks used by different organizations. And we reviewed this to determine what criteria is most important and would be easily adopted and adapted. Uh, and adaptable by coordinators working in this space. Um, and we asked ourselves, should we focus on an existing new or hybrid model? Um, and we agreed that it should be approached from a hybrid multidimensional lens, whereby any m &E kind of framework or tool should be iterative. It should not be a one size fits all and can be adopted across various organizations in the deep sea space. Um, but the capacity building piece itself was missing from the resources that we had collected. And lastly, we also um, wanted to focus on long-term impacts to help us answer the so what of our initiatives um, and to ensure that we could minimize harm to local communities and also provide accountability. Um, and I will brief you on the process uh, that we underwent for this work. 
Uh, so this work started um, in Q4 of last year, where we started with interviews um, with six organizations working in the deep sea capacity development space, uh, namely Ocean Discovery League, COBRA, UNOS Desk, uh, Doers, uh, the DUS Doers Program, the Ocean Exploration Trust, and NOAA Ocean Exploration. Um, we had these interviews to basically understand their perspective on monitoring and evaluation, existing frameworks and best practices they are using, gaps and challenges to implementing monitoring and evaluation in the capacity development programs, and to understand a bit more about the, the kind of similar challenges um, and also opportunities that we see through this work. And we started with, uh, we had the aim to build awareness and communicate the value of monitoring and evaluation and to guide the work, to build the guidelines for phase two of this work, uh, we realized early on that in order to effectively come up with monitoring and evaluation guidelines, the initial phase of this uh, initiative will need to be a much more reflective process uh, where organizations can identify strengths and areas for improvement and also come up with a plan of action for their initiatives. Um, subsequently, we developed the maturity model as a standalone product for phase one of this work. Uh, we collaborated with an m &E specialist, uh, Dr. Carissa Carwood, to develop an approach for the deep sea community, including a definition of capacity development that would guide us in this work. Um, we wanted this maturity model to be something that progress, um, program coordinators who have little or no experience with monitoring and evaluation to be able to use. And they can utilize the maturity model with their current monitoring and evaluation efforts and ensure that categories and perimeters align with what they're doing with their programs. And they will, be, um, and they will have the capacity to test out or self-assess using the maturity model. So it needs to be user-friendly and helpful. And we also engage two reviewers from South Africa and Montserrat to help fine tune the version one of the maturity model. And currently uh, we are doing the validation exercise where we invite um, test users uh, from the deep sea community like yourselves in this uh, session to basically help us really improve the version one of this maturity model through um, your detailed feedback um, and if you are interested to be a test user, please reach out to us. We'll have more details um, in the upcoming slides. And uh, once we have uh, harmonized all the feedback that we've gotten from the community, we will then incorporate all of this into the version two of the emergency model and funding dependent next year. We hope to then um, develop the m &E guidelines that we can adapt across the deep sea space for um, everyone to use. So we needed to think about what capacity development looks like in the deep sea sector and looking at the universal criteria across the capacity development definition um, so that we could start with this work to ensure that you know, we have a shared understanding of the capacity def uh, development definition, which can also influence outcomes of capacity development. And to guide the work for the maturity model, ODL has established a definition for capacity development that considers the various framings for capacity building as defined by better evaluation in 2022. Uh, we also took recommendations from the Harden Davis paper and also discussions from the two capacity development uh, due sessions in 2022 that we organized uh, where we asked the community what capacity development means to them and also last year's session where the deep sea community also um, discuss what the, they need for capacity development. So we took all of this into account to help us establish a definition for capacity development. So we thank um, the deep sea community and the DUS community for really helping us to shape this capacity de uh, development definition. So what is the capacity development definition that we have developed? It is the so capacity development is in the deep sea sector is the long-term and sustained advancement of local knowledge, collaboration, and leadership within communities interested or engaged in deep sea research or exploration. Initiatives are grounded in a community-driven approach, which aims to reduce barriers while amplifying existing research and exploration efforts that align with the community's right to agency, autonomy, and self-determination. 
Initiatives are tailored to each local and global community's specific needs, including knowledge building, skills training, mentorship, and train-the-trainer -trainer models to cultivate local talent and leadership. Emphasis will be placed on providing participants with the skills and knowledge to navigate the evolving challenges and advancements in the deep sea sector. Crucially, programs will help secure access to the necessary resources and financial support for all training and implementation. All approaches consider long-term and sustainable impacts and ensure that positive outcomes that benefit the local and global communities are maintained and continue to evolve. So the following definition um, identifies common themes and points raised from the sources that I've mentioned earlier. And the bold wordings that um, you saw from the previous slide uh, are the six distinct categories that we use for the maturity model. Uh, and they are community-centered EPAS, cultivating local talent and leadership, long-term impact and sustainability, strengthening local capacities, amplification of research, and competency leads to adaptability. So before we get into um, more in-depth into the maturity model, it is time for a slider question. So how many of you are familiar with or have used a maturity model in the past? Right, I think um, we have gotten most responses from the participants, thank you for including your answer in the Slido. So we did expect this uh, feedback because um, when Kitty and I started this work as well, we weren't familiar with this tool. And we primarily um, got a lot of guidance on this work from Carlisa, our m and &E specialist, who actually have used this tool and framework in her previous m and &E work. And I will share a case study that she has worked on um, uh, just short, in a, in a bit. So, Yes, I think we can go to the definition now. Right, so what is a maturity model? It is basically a resource or a framework that helps organizations and teams assess their, their capabilities in a structured way and identify areas for improvement and provide a roadmap to enhance their ability to conduct and support deep sea research activities. And the purpose of a maturity model is basically to get you to start reflecting on where your initiatives currently stand. Uh, it is an exercise basically um, for uh, self-reflection to help identify gaps and strengths and then find ways to improve your program and have a current and, and have a, an action plan after that. And this is a great way to understand what you're currently doing and how well you're doing it and how to make it even better. So we recognize that this will not be an easy process either, where it could be uncomfortable, but it's important to do because we want to avoid um, repeating same mistakes in program design and implementation or capacity development initiatives and to ensure that our intended impacts are well thought out and meaningful. So aligning the maturity model with a monitoring and evaluation work ensures that assessment, the assessment that you do connects to project objectives. So it helps focus or in critical areas for success and ensures your program evaluation is integrated. And it offers advice on the next steps um, an organization can take to enhance their capacity. And it establishes benchmarks for also assessing capacity development to, to promote consistency and compar comparability. So the main thing is once you do this exercise, you will have a clear action plan to implement your desired improvement or changes within your capacity development issue, initiative. So um, the version one document or maturity model that we have come up with will go through iterations based on the community's feedback. But uh, we wanted this maturity model to be utilized by those who will find this resource useful. Um, going back to the Hardin Davis paper where they mentioned that there needs to be more um, explicit spaces where stakeholders, scientists, policymakers, and those involved in capacity development programs can speak openly about the experience. We also feel that the maturity model could facilitate a two-way feedback loop when utilized by other stakeholders. And with that in mind, the three groups of target users for version one of this maturity model are firstly, the capacity building agents or partners. So these are organizations and individuals who are actively engaged in the planning, overseeing, implementing, and evaluating of capacity development initiatives. 
within the deep sea research or ocean science sector. Um, secondly, would be the community stakeholders who are those affected by or involved in capacity development initiatives in this space, as well as external st stakeholders. So the emergency model can serve as a shared reference point for external individuals or organizations that reinforce, facilitate, and catalyze capacity development. And this includes funders, NGOs, uh, academic institutions, and also governmental agencies. Uh, next, I will share the case study for the maturity model, which our um, MNE specialists actually helped develop and to just see the thought process behind the design of the maturity model that she worked on and how it has been used since its launch to ground a bit of the work um, that we will be discussing um, shortly. So Carlisa was part of the Museums and Race Steering Committee, which has previously gone through a similar process to develop a maturity model. So their model takes the form of a report card which came about from museum professionals asking how they can get their museums to start thinking critically about issues relating to equity and inclusion. So they took that initial information and created a maturity model tool that will allow organizations to proactively reflect on and name where they are in the work, as well as to identify the work they still needed to do. So their goal here was to start to create acknowledgement as well as accountability for engaging in this work while providing a tool that helped them to assess and benchmark their progress towards addressing these issues. So they debuted the report card in 2018, and after sharing it at several conferences, workshops, and other convenings over the past few years, um, they've also moved through several iterations based on feedback from both individuals as well as organizations who've utilized it. So the, the, their report card uh, presents six dimensions that organizations can examine to evaluate their progress in this work. This include governance, funding, representation, responsiveness, resources, and transparency. So it asks that organizations grade themselves on the work being done currently and in the past year, and then set a goal for where they'd like to be within the next year. They frame the maturity model as a grading system, as this is a concept that most people are familiar with. So in terms of the grading system of the maturity model and F, indicates that a museum is not making any effort towards equity work or is in denial about their lack of efforts. Um, on the other hand, an A signifies that a museum is in a transformation stage where diversity and equity efforts um, are fully integrated into their institutional fabric and they continue to assess these efforts regularly for sustainability in an ever-changing environment. So their intention with this particular mat maturity model was to be provocative and highlight that if equity work is not being done intentionally, the organization is quote unquote failing. So the maturity model can be used to evaluate perceptions of current progress at a museum or for individu individuals at any level in the organization to self-assess their areas of work and advance their planning or operational goals within an equity context. So ultimately the report card is not just a one-time assessment, but it's also a practical tool designed to be revisited regularly. So it allows them to assess progress, identify areas for improvement, and push the organization toward meaningful change. Uh, I'll pass the mic back to Kelly. Thanks, Nadia. So um, now that you have a little bit more information about what a maturity model is, uh, we are gonna go ahead and explain how to use the one that we have developed. Um, for those of you that have just joined, I have put the link uh, to the Google Drive in the chat where you can find the document itself. So our maturity model has taken the capacity development definition and framed it along a maturity continuum. This provides a structured approach for coordinators and organizations to gauge their program's current level of maturity. The six categories that make up the definition are broken down into levels, initial, intermediate, and advanced. These provide clarity on the incremental steps necessary for progression. Utilizing the maturity model helps coordinators and organizations in devising actionable plans to implement desired improvements. Essentially, it offers a systematic approach to identifying strengths and addressing areas of improvement thus enhancing overall program effectiveness. So of the six categories defined by the capacity development definition, they are split into two different types. On the right hand side here in teal, we have the non-negotiable categories. These refer to categories that require all of the components described by them to be included within the program. 
And these include community-centered ethos, cultivating local talent and leadership, and long-term impact and sustainability. This is in contrast to the left-hand side. These are the non-negotiable categories. These refer to um, categories that, the, um, that encompass a various number of components. And this means that coordinators can select a minimum of three components that align with their program or initiatives objectives. These include competency leads to adaptability, amplification of research and strengthening local capacities. So if we take a zoomed out, uh, a look at a zoomed out example of our maturity model, you can see that on the left hand side, we have the six categories, starting with the non-negotiable categories and followed by the negotiables. And then each category is then split into three levels, initial, intermediate, and advanced. Now, if we take a closer look at that first non-negotiable category, community-centered ethos, um, as we zoom in, we can see that each category will have a description of the components on the left-hand side, and then a thorough explanation of each level um, on the right. For the sake of this example, we have cut this down to fit it onto the slide. However, a full description of this category is found in the maturity model document. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, the model has been designed in such a way where each level builds off the previous one, providing clarity on the incremental steps necessary for progression. Um, so to explain this a little bit further, we can use the example of organization A, is carrying out a program that aims to support community-led research initiatives. We would expect for a program like this to be addressing the um, category of community-centered ethos in their work, which in part um, is uh, recognizing the importance of engaging and involving communities directly impacted by or with a vested interest in deep sea research and exploration. This ethos ensures that the benefits of scientific activities are shared meaningfully. The organization would then read across the levels to decide which level, level resonates with the work that they are currently carrying out. Each level covers many different components, um, but for the example that I'm providing, we're just going to focus on dialogue. So you can see for this initial maturity, the program has to be designed um, or is designed by consulting the community in a one-way dialogue. For the program to proceed to an intermediate level, the program needs to be developed by engaging in a two-way dialogue with communities. And for the um, maturity to be increased to an advanced level, then the program needs to be co-created with the communities and community members have leadership roles in the programs. Now, you may find that as you're reflecting on your initiative, that it falls across um, many different levels and the components described. Um, this is completely normal. Uh, this model isn't intended to be a rigid or strict checklist, but rather to act as a tool to highlight where your initiative currently stands. So how do we put this maturity model into action? Um, so I've touched on this a little bit in the example I just provided, but the first step would be to select a category, uh, select a category that your program addresses. Your program may address, uh, address several categories, but we suggest you just start off with choosing one. The next step is to review it, so familiarize yourself with the components and the description of each level. Once you've done that, you can then reflect on the maturity of your initiative and determine its position in the model. We have provided a set of questions that can guide your reflection um, that can be found in the maturity model document. And as Nadia mentioned earlier, this isn't necessarily meant to be the most comfortable process, but it will certainly help you in determining where your initiative currently is. So once you've um, determined its position, uh, you can then identify the areas of improvement for your program. So what can you do to reach these um, further levels in the model? You can then take these uh, identified areas of improvement and create a theory of change from that. These areas of improvement will be used as your outcomes in that TOC. 
And finally, you can then develop an implementation and evaluation plan where you can implement and evaluate the process. So um, although on this slide, this looks like a linear process, we do encourage you to see it more as a cyclical and iterative one, where you can come back to it um, once you've implemented changes to see where your initiative now stands. Okay, so uh, now let's take a look at the theory of change and how you can integrate it within your maturity model. So for those of you who aren't familiar, um, the theory of change is a framework that outlines the expected pathways for achieving long-term goals by mapping out all the necessary outcomes required to reach that goal. Um, it serves to articulate how and why change is anticipated to occur within a program or initiative. Um, it establishes a clear link between the actions of a program and its overarching goals. And by identifying these sort of sequential outcomes required for success, it provides a roadmap for implementation. Now, a theory of change is best utilized at the outset of a program uh, to guide the planning and the implementation, and it can then be refined throughout the program cycle. However, if you've never used a theory of change before, developing one mid-program can still provide valuable insights into your implementation and enhance program coherence. So we are going to um, go through a template uh, briefly, just so you can see um, how this all fits together. Keep in mind, there are many templates out there that can be used to develop a theory of change, and we are just presenting one way to approach it. So in front of you, you can see a table and it's separated into five columns. Each column describes a different aspect of your programmatic cycle. This top row is for the narrative and it describes what is occurring at each stage. And the bottom row is for quantitative numbers and metrics that you'll use to subsequently measure each stage. The first two columns on the left here are used to describe the, your program or initiatives work itself. And the following three columns are to capture the intended results. So the order in which you fill in this um, theory of change is you start off with your um, statement about the gap or challenge that you are addressing. Once you have stated what the gap or challenge is, you then um, work from the right hand side to the left. So once you've determined what your gap is, you then start with your impact. So you write down what your what the ultimate uh, bold visionary um, impact of your work is. Um, this is followed by your outcomes. So how will we see that signs of this project has been effective post initial launch? Again, a little bit further back, you then list out your outcomes. So how will you, how will you measure the initial success of this program or initiative? Um, these are short-term success metrics and usually are things like number of people involved in the program or percentage participation. And then to further back, you will want to write out your processes. So what are the key activities you will conduct to reach your goal? And lastly, your inputs. So these are all the resources you need to complete the task. How many people? What is the budget? Um, do you need the location, things like that. All of those initial resources are listed there. Now, uh, I well, we both recognize that um, for those of you who haven't come across a theory of change before, this can sometimes seem quite daunting and a bit nebulous. However, in the document, we have included two examples of how to help you follow along. The first is for a well-funded organization uh, that is launching a program for policy leaders and the second one, which you can see on the screen here, is a theory of change for a grassroots organization that is supporting community-led research initiatives. Both examples go through each step so you can see how all the components fit together. So now that we have equipped you with the knowledge of how you can use a maturity model, um, who can use a maturity model? The next question really is when to use a maturity model. Um, now, the model itself is a versatile tool that is applicable at any stage in the programmatic cycle, whether in planning, implementation, or evaluation. It's not solely for those 
actively coordinating programs. It can aid in planning um, of future endeavors or evaluating past ones. When implemented in the planning phase, a maturity model can help identify a clear roadmap and define what constitutes an effective intervention. Um, if used um, correctly, then it can also help you understand the current barriers that could hinder your program as well. Um, if you decide to use it during your implementation phase, then it can help determine short-term changes to enhance program outcomes. Um, and finally, if you use the maturity model once the program has finished, then um, it can help identify learning outcomes and formulate a plan of action for the next phase. Regardless of the phase you're in, the model remains relevant as it sheds light on areas needing improvement and facilitates the implementation of either immediate or more broader long-term changes. So at this point, um, we encourage you to look over the document and um, incorporate and let us know the feedback that you um, have. So um, we would be really curious. Um, we understand that this is a lot of information that we've just given to you in the past 38 minutes, um, but we would be really curious to hear from you if you think that this tool could be useful for you and your team to adopt within your work, or if you think, no, perhaps this isn't something that would be useful. We'll just give you a minute or so to fill that out. And again, if you need the link, then just let us know. Well, uh, this is looking positive um, that most of you find, think that this could be useful. Um, that's a relief. <laughs> um, We'll give you a couple more seconds and then we'll move on to the next Slido question. Um, does anybody, if anybody needs a little bit longer, you can just give us a thumbs up or hands up or say, Please wait. Okay. I think we're gonna move on to the next question, Nadia. Um, well, we are very happy, uh, first and foremost, that uh, most of you find, almost all of you find this tool uh, relevant to your work. I think that was our main aim was to provide something that's user-friendly for the DC community as a way to start um, assessing the current capacity development initiatives that are being done uh, within the space. And our next question um, that we would like to find out based on your initial impressions and how you see this could be applicable to your work is what are the additional support or resources that you would need to effectively use the model in your programs or initiatives um, and this feedback would actually help us to identify at which stage of your program um, in terms of how and when you want to use this. And then we'll fine tune that as well um, by um, improving the way we design the maturity model as this is iterative. So the question that we would like to find out um, in terms of resources is, um, I think we would like you to uh, let us know at which point stage of your program, you would find this useful. Um, and then we can kind of look back at how we are communicating the maturity model as well as the way we're designing it to support um, more programs to eventually integrate this into their monitoring and evaluation work as a whole. And that will also then help us to develop the guidelines better um, next year as we will have uh, a clearer idea on where that support can happen uh, within your programmatic cycle. So your feedback um, you know, for this question would be really, really useful as well for us to start doing that.
Katie, I think a lot of them have did it tiny face though. Yeah. Which, yes. And That's I think this is also, yeah, this resonates with us as well as we are also in our planning phase for a lot of our capacity development programs. So I think this is also um, a way to help us think a lot more about uh, what we mentioned earlier, which was um, on accountability, that two-way kind of feedback loop, uh, loop we would like to create with our stakeholders as well as the communities that we engage with. Um, so this is all very um, insightful for us. I think we can go to the next slide. Sure. Right, so just to um, inform you on what the next steps would be for this work. Um, so as mentioned earlier, we are currently in the validation exercise phase where we invite all of you, um, if you are interested or keen, to use this um, model for your own capacity development program or initiative to reach out to us. Uh, we would love to have you as a test user. Um, we will send you a, a questionnaire where you can actually provide us more detailed feedback on the actual um, process of you using the maturity model, what worked, uh, what didn't really, um, what was missing, and then you can give us all of that feedback for us to fine tune for version two of the maturity model. So if you would like to be a test user uh, for the model, please reach out to us. Um, we'll share our emails um, in the next slide. But um, also just to let you know what will happen after we collate all that feedback from the community, um, which we hope will run from June to September for the actual um, validation exercise period. Then uh, after that, what we'll do is um, fine tune the version two of the maturity model, which we'll publish on our website. And from there, uh, we hope to then um, develop the ME guidelines, um, which we think um, can be a lot more are robust for the deep sea community um, looking at what people are talk, um, saying about the maturity model and how would that look like in terms of um, capacity development initiatives in this sector. So that would be the next steps for this m &E initiative that we are currently working on. So please um, get in touch with us. We would really, really um, love to hear your feedback on the maturity model. You can get in touch with us at this email address. Um, if you have any comments on the actual maturity model um, that you would like to send us over email, you can also get in touch with us um, through this email address. Um, but yes, I think that um, was the introduction to the maturity model that we have developed um, over the past few months. Um, we would love to hear any thoughts or any questions that you have uh, regarding the work we just presented. So yeah. Um, please unmute yourself um, if you would like to ask any questions. Right. So thank you so much um, for joining our session. Um, definitely we'll get back um, with, yeah, we'll definitely get in touch with uh, all of you who've uh, expressed your interest to be a test user. And we have that document as well that we shared. So if you want to give us more detailed feedback over email, please do so as well. Um, thank you so much, and we hope to share what we got out of the validation exercise with you in the upcoming month. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.